All right. Welcome. Happy Halloween, although day after Halloween, I guess. Um, okay, so we were going to finish our example. Uh, we were talking about sleep deprived transportation workers, and we were comparing the control group to the truck drivers. Is there a difference between the proportions of truck drivers and non-transportation workers, which is the control group, who get less than six hours of sleep per day? So that would mean they're considered sleep deprived. Um, two proportions, right? Comparing two proportions means we have these wordy uh, questions, right? Where we have to talk about the proportion of the truckers and the proportion of the control group. So we did some, some work identifying what was given in the question. And then we found our both of our sample proportions, right? The sample proportion for the control group, for the truckers. And then we also needed to find the pooled proportion, right? We checked the conditions, which are still independence and success failure for two sample proportions, except now that I have two samples, I need to check that both sample sizes um, satisfy the success failure condition. And of course, both samples have to satisfy the independence condition, which they all did. That was all great. So then what we can do is we can find the standard error of the difference in the proportions using the pooled proportion, right? Um, and then we were able to actually start the problem. Right. We were able to state our hypotheses and we said, OK, the null hypothesis for a two sample proportion question will always be P1 is equal to P2. Right. In this case, the proportion of the control is equal to the proportion of the truckers. Or if you prefer, right, we are technically hypothesizing about the difference in the proportions. How does it compare to zero? Right. And so um, if you prefer to write it this way, that's that's great. Right. But I'm a little bit lazy, so I, I actually prefer the first way. Because we want to know if there's a difference, we have a two sided test. Remember, we, we kind of keep that in mind until we need to find our P value. That's when it comes back in. Right. And so I like to make a little note to myself that this is a two sided test. Okay. But before we can do that, find the p-value, we need to do the test, do the calculation. And um, it is a z-score still. Okay. We're seeing how far is the difference in the sample proportions from a difference of zero, which we'll, we're always hypothesizing that it's zero. And then the standard error uses the pooled proportion. the dog. Um, so then we did all the work, right? Being really careful that you're going to do uh, one over N1 plus one over N2 first, right? Simplify those, those fractions and then multiply through and then don't forget the square root, right? Otherwise things will, will be all, all bungled. Yeah. But then we found a z-score of negative 1.65. Okay. And remember, z, if you're using the table, has to be to two decimal places. So then we were ready to find the p-value. Okay. For z-scores, we're able to find the one-sided p-value using the z-table, right? So we found a z of negative 1.65, the area in the tail, right? Which in this case, the tail is on the left. So the area to the left was 0 0.0495, okay? That's our one-sided p-value. But remember from the alternative hypothesis that we had a two-sided test, right? And so what do we need to do? We need to uh, essentially replicate this area on the upper end as well, okay? And so how do we do that? We multiply by two, right? And so our two-sided p-value was 0 0.099. And then uh, if you were in my afternoon class, I remembered to, to give you this one. Uh, but if you're in the morning one, this is the first time you're seeing it. 
Uh, but I do find, it, although it's a little bit cheeky, but uh, but I do find that it's helpful in remembering um, what to do right with your p values. So when the p is low, so when the p value is is small enough, right, then the null hypothesis must go, right. And so, um, yeah. So I do find that that's kind of helpful, although it is cheeky, but it is helpful. All right. So then I said, all right, we ran out of time. So I said, how about you guys try your conclusion on your own and then uh, we'll, we'll finish it together. So here we are. So I brought in uh, our p-value, right? our two-sided p-value is 0 0.099. And then I just uh, brought in this little, little, is it a meme? I don't know. Um, to remind us, okay. So step four is our conclusion. Sorry, just a second. Okay, I'm back. Had to move the dog. She was chewing on everything. Uh, okay, so step four, our conclusion. Remember our conclusion has three parts, right? First thing we're going to do, and maybe let's just as a reminder here, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to state the conclusion comparing or uh, we have to compare our p-value to the alpha level, right? So compare the p-value to the alpha level. Okay. That's the first thing we're going to do. Second thing we're going to do is what does that comparison tell us about the null hypothesis, right? And so conclusion in terms of H naught. And then finally, most importantly, arguably, is the conclusion in terms of the question, right? Inclusion in terms of the question. Okay, so we're ready. And maybe I'll use the I'll use the same colors that I used here. So our conclusion, our two-sided p-value. Oh, I thought it was in the highlighter here. Uh, it was 0 0.099. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the question just to see if there was an alpha level given, a significance level given. I don't think that there was. Uh, just scanning the question, there was not. What's our default? Our default is an alpha level of 0.05. Okay. So because there's none given, we'll use 0.05. So 0 0.099 is not less than the alpha level. Okay. You'll see why I chose that weird wording in a little bit. Okay, so since the two-sided p-value of 0 0.099, okay, you want to show off that you knew it was supposed to be a two-sided p-value. You want to tell me what the value is, right? 0 0.099 is not less than the alpha level. And in this case, we weren't given an alpha level. So I'm going to say the assumed alpha level of 0 0.05, less than the assumed alpha level. of 0.05, okay? I'm using this sentence structure of 0 0.099 is not less than the assumed alpha level, which means we do not have enough evidence to reject H0, right? Because it's not small enough, okay? So then, uh, since the two-sided p-value is not less than the assumed alpha level of 0.05, we do not 
have enough evidence enough evidence to reject H naught. Right. If I'm not rejecting H naught, I don't need to, that's the end, right? I'm not not rejecting it in favor of HA. Okay, and so that's good. Now, what does that mean in terms of the question here? Right. If I don't have enough evidence to reject H naught, okay, then I'm gonna go to the question to see if I have any clues. Right. I want to conduct a hypothesis test, and I'm just gonna try. Try my best to just rework this question. Whoops. Rework this uh, question as an answer, right? So here, conduct a hypothesis test to evaluate if these data provide evidence of a difference between the proportions of truck drivers and non-transportation workers who get less than six hours of sleep per day. Well, this data do not provide evidence of a difference between the proportions of truck drivers and non-transportation workers who get less than six hours of sleep per day. Okay, so it's wordy, but you're not having to come up with a, a lot of that, right? And so therefore, therefore the data do not, oops, do not provide evidence of a difference between the proportions. Just completely stealing the question and rewording it as an answer. Uh, between the proportions, of truck drivers and non-transportation workers who get less than six hours of sleep, who get less than six hours of sleep per day. All right, so here, just kind of stealing this and using it as our conclusion up there. Yeah. Nice. Okay, so wordy, but not too bad, right? All right, so that's how we test I'd do a hypothesis test for a difference of two sample proportions, right? So we have we have two proportions. Now, of course, today we're going to focus on, well, what if I have more than two proportions or rather more than three proportions? Okay, three or more, I should say. Okay. So let's see where this page break is. Uh, should be soon. Yeah, let's do it here. So 6.3. What is it called? Uh, Six point three. Testing for goodness of fit using chi squared, of course. Uh, <laughs> let's see here. Testing for goodness of fit. Is that even proper English? I'm not sure. Uh, using chi-squared. Using chi-squared. I think is how they, yeah. Okay. So uh, let's see here. All right. So now what are we doing? We're testing more than three or more when we want to analyze uh, three or more proportions. To analyze three or more proportions. 
right? So if we have three or more categories, can we look at these and say, okay, yeah, this, this fits what I expected to see here, or it does not, it, it strayed from what I was expecting to see. Okay, so this is for three or more proportions. The chi-squared, so here, let's just emphasize this. So chi-squared looks like this. It looks like a, like a fancy capital X, just kind of with a little, little twirl on it. And so this is how you read it, uh, chi-square, or chi-squared if you want. I guess kind of squared. Okay. And so it's it's not chi, it's chi. You don't want to be laughed at. Okay. And so you want to read it as, as chi squared. Okay. So in one sample proportion and two sample proportions, our test statistic that we calculated was a Z. Okay. Uh, now that we're going to be looking at more than three proportions or more than two, uh, then what we're going to calculate is called a chi-squared. Okay. So um, for one and two sample proportions, two sample proportion questions, we calculated a z-score as our test statistic. We calculated a z-score as our test statistic. Yeah. For three or more proportions, we're going to calculate a chi-squared instead. For three or more proportions, we calculate a chi-squared instead. What's really nice about uh, analyzing more than three proportions uh, is that we're not going to bother with confidence intervals anymore. Um, I'm sure they exist. I've never used them. We are going to focus on just hypothesis testing. Okay. So for chi-squared problems, okay, we only do hypothesis testing. So for chi-squared problems, We only do hypothesis testing. Maybe that's not worth a smiley face because that's a, hypothesis testing is harder, right? Than kind of than confidence intervals, but I mean it eliminates some of that, some of the things that we could do, right? We're just going to be doing hypothesis testing. Okay. And just like a z-score can be used in multiple different scenarios, the chi-squared can also be used in multiple different scenarios. So in 6.3, we're going to do goodness of fit testing. And in 6.4, which is on Thursday, we're going to do uh, tests for independence. Okay. So just as z-scores were applied to different scenarios, right? To different types of questions, to different types of questions. Chi-squared will also be able, uh, will also be applied. Chi-squared will also be applied to different questions. Specifically in 6.3, we do goodness of fit testing. Goodness of fit 
testing. Okay. Really what that's going to translate to for us is that we just have one categorical variable with multiple categories. Okay. And maybe I'll put this here, 6.3, and then I'll do a follow-up here. One categorical variable is how we're going to use it. One categorical variable with multiple categories. And in 6.4, we're going to do a chi-squared test of independence. Uh, which we're going to introduce two variables. So now I've got a, a two-way table, right? Variable one, variable two, both of them are categorical. Right, and so uh, they have some number of categories, each of them, right? And we just wanna know, are these two variables independent of each other, okay? And we use the same methods. So, so the methods that we established today, we can extend to a two-way table and it's, it's not too bad. So two categorical variables, okay? Okay, so chi-squared, what is it? All right, so chi-squared is a, a little bit sneaky because the shape of the chi-squared distribution changes depending on how many categories you have and how we communicate that is uh, through something called degrees of freedom. Okay. So the shape, of the chi-squared distribution, that doesn't look like a two, chi-squared distribution changes as the degrees of freedom changes. Okay. Changes as the degrees of freedom changes. Uh, and there's this kind of cute illustration in the textbook that I'll grab from the textbook. Okay. Where, let's see if I can fit it all on this page here. All right. Where if we have two degrees of freedom, okay, then the shape of the distribution looks like this. If we have four degrees of freedom, the center kind of moves, it gets larger, right? And, and it actually turns out that it, it is at the degrees of freedom, okay? So that's how you can remember that it moves out, okay? But really what's happening as you increase your degrees of freedom, this kind of curve moves to the center, right? And so eventually, right, it'll tend towards a normal distribution, but for us, we're not going to deal with that, right? And so we're going to have this skewed distribution and it's always skewed to the right. Okay. So chi squared is skewed to the right. Okay. Now, for the degrees of freedom, if we're if we only have one variable, Right, one categorical variable, the degrees of freedom will be the number of categories minus one. Okay. So if we have one categorical variable, and maybe I'll bump this up here. Move that there and then move this here because what? There. If we have one categorical variable, the degrees of freedom will 
which we usually abbreviate DF, is the number of categories minus one. Is the number of categories, which we usually denote by a K, a lowercase K, minus one. So then how do we write that? The degrees of freedom is gonna be K minus one. Okay. In a goodness of fit test, okay, we're going to have uh, some observed distribution of counts that we want to compare to an expected distribution of counts. Okay. So, and that's true for any chi-squared test. So in a chi-squared test, not just the goodness of fit test, uh, in a chi-squared test, we want to compare the observed count, right? Or the dis uh, observed distribution of counts to the expected distribution of counts. We want to compare the observed distribu distribution, observed distribution of counts to an expected distribution of counts. Okay, so I brought in this uh, explanation from the textbook. So uh, a chi-squared test for a one-way table. One-way table is really just saying one categorical variable, right, with many categories. Right. So here, a one-way table is just a table of one categorical variable which we've seen in the past, right? In fact, we've seen mostly two-way tables, right? Two, uh, two variables against each other. But suppose we're gonna evaluate whether there's convincing evidence that a set of observed counts, so how we're denoting those are 01, 02, 03, 04, all the way up to okay, right? Remember where K is the number of categories are unusually different from what might be expected under a null hypothesis. Right. And so uh, the null hypothesis in our case is going to be, okay, do these observed counts follow the, uh, the distribution of the expected counts? Okay. Um, so I guess called the expected, that's a typo, I'm pretty sure, called the expected counts uh, that are based on the null hypothesis. Now that's kind of vague and generic, but I'll give it to you in a second here. Uh, and how we denote those are we have some expected count for category one, some expected count for category two, an expected count for category all the way up to K. So if here are conditions, right? If each expected count is at least five and the null hypothesis is true, okay, then the test statistic below, so this is going to be a chi-squared, follows a chi-squared distribution with k minus one degrees of freedom. And so chi-squared, they, they just use a capital X, I guess. Um, chi-squared is the observed count in category one minus the expected count, then square it, divided by the expected count in category one. And then we do that and we sum them all for each of the categories. I've used summation notation on our formula sheet, so I'll bring that in just so you can, can see it. But first, let's finish reading this. So the p-value is going to be found by looking at the upper tail of the chi-squared distribution. Remembering that the chi-squared distribution in general is just a skewed to the right distribution, right? And so what it looks like Right, so in general, a chi-squared distribution is going to look something like this. Okay. 
Okay. And we're going to find our calculated chi squared. And what we're going to say is that the area in the upper tail is always the p value. So we're not going to talk about the one sided, two sided p values anymore because there is only one tail in a skewed distribution, right? So we say that this, oh, huh. this is the p value. The p value is always the upper tail. Yeah. for chi-squared tests. Oops, that was a weird chi, chi-squared tests. Okay. So we're not gonna be differentiating between one-sided and two-sided tests. It's always just gonna be a two-sided test, but the area in the upper tail. And that's a little bit confusing, but that's just how it is. Okay. So what we're going to find is that the larger the chi-squared value is, the smaller the p-value is, right? And that's going to be the evidence against H0. Okay? And so as, as chi-squared gets larger, right, it moves out into the tail, the p-value gets smaller. the p-value gets smaller. Yeah. Okay, so how did I write this? How did I summarize this on your formula sheet? Okay. So today we're doing the chi-squared goodness of fit testing, but for next day, You've got this one here if you wanted to look at it. Okay. And we pretty much do the same thing all over again, just with two variables instead of just one. Okay. So <clears throat> I have given you the null hypothesis here, but let's just parking lot that for a little bit. So we've got the chi squared is the sum, right? And that's they wrote it out explicitly here. They actually added up all of these, right? But in general, right, we can write the sum of the observed minus the expected for each category I, generically I, then square it and then divide by the expected count, okay? And I've also given you the degrees of freedom as K minus one, where you have to remember that K is the number of categories. Okay. Now let's talk about the null hypothesis. So the null hypothesis that I've given to you is that the observed distribution equals the expected distribution. Okay, That is for goodness of fit testing. Okay. It's pretty generic and I want to see something more question specific uh, when, you're, when you're writing your, your null hypothesis, but in general this is what it is. So the observed distribution is the same as the expected distribution, or it's not significantly different from the expected distribution. Okay? Once we've seen an example, uh, you'll, you'll hopefully have a better connection to that. Okay. But before we can do an example, there are two things that we have to look at. We have to look at, okay, well, what are the conditions, right? We saw we saw one of the conditions, but there are two. Ah, okay. Um, and so, and then the second thing that we need to know is how can we find the p-values, right? If I have a chi-squared, I can't use a z-table anymore which means that we introduce a chi-squared table, or of course, if you want to use R, you're welcome to, right? So that's great, or Excel, or whatever you want. Okay. Um, but they all use the same information, right? You're going to need the chi-squared test statistic, and you're going to need your degrees of freedom regardless. Okay. So uh, let's see here. All right, the conditions that we need to check for a chi-squared. These. Okay. So the conditions for a chi-squared test. Okay. 
First one is independence. Surprise, surprise. Each case that contributes a count to the table okay, must be independent of all the other cases in the table. One of the ways that we can ensure that is by randomly sampling, right? And looking how many counts do I have in each category? That's a, a perfectly reasonable way to uh, assure independence, right? So uh, we can assume independence if uh, it was, they were randomly sampled. I guess I should say subjects were randomly sampled. Let's delete that. Subjects were randomly sampled. Yeah. Then we can assume that each case is independent of all the other cases. So we're used to checking that condition. The condition that's new to us, right? This is where we usually do our success failure condition, but we don't do that anymore. Now we're gonna do um, a sample size check, okay? So each cell, right? Or each, uh, yeah, each expected count must be at least five. Okay. So if you're expecting less than five counts in a cell, then you would need to increase your sample size, right, in order to pick up on those rare observations. Same idea as the success, success failure condition. Uh, it's just now we have these expected cases in each cell, so I have to have at least five expected cases in each cell. Okay. So, good. Of course, you can go ahead and do a chi-squared. If it doesn't satisfy, you'll have other, or in later courses, you'll see, um, you'll have other tools. You, you don't have to use the chi-squared if you have less than five expected, right? But the reason that we don't use it anymore is because the error rates are going to be too large. Okay. But that's, as long as we're checking the conditions, that's okay. Okay. So to find the p-value right, for a chi-squared test, we need to use, or we are going, I'm going to use a, a chi-squared table. Like I said, you're welcome to use R or Excel or whatever, but, um, but you'll have the table. So it's nice to know how to use it. I'll put it on a fresh page here. To find the p-value, oops. For a chi-squared test, we can use R or Excel. Oops. Wait. Is that how you spell Excel? Yeah. Don't doubt yourself. Um, R or Excel or a chi-squared table. Oops. So the chi-squared table that I attached to your assignment and also your quiz uh, it looks like this. And it, I kept the explanation for using the chi-squared probability table uh, just because it, it might be nice to have. A, there's no reason to remove it, but the actual chi-squared table is on the second page. Okay. Now, what we have is we're basically only ever going to use this top portion of the table. So I'm going to bring that in here. Okay. It does continue, right, of course. But here, these are the degrees of freedom. Do, 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 do. Okay. And then we're told that in the upper tail, right, this is going to be the area in the upper tail. And maybe what I'll do is I'll bump this down just a smidge. Okay, so these, this is saying that this is the area in the upper tail. 
Mm -hmm. Which is the p value. Mm -hmm. So what it's saying is that, okay, if we look at five degrees of freedom, thinking about how do we get the degrees of freedom? If we only have one categorical variable, to get five degrees of freedom, I would need to have six categories, right? Because the degrees of freedom is K minus one. So if I have five degrees of freedom, K must be six, right? So that means I have six categories that I wanna look at, okay? <laughs> That's a lot of categories. Often, you know, we, we won't have more than that that we wanna consider. Okay? So that's why I cut the table. The table extends, but I, I cut it a little bit. It does keep going, okay? But remembering that your degrees of freedom is not gonna change. The number of categories that you have is not gonna change within the question. So once you have your degrees of freedom, then you're stuck on this line, right? Let's say we have five degrees of freedom, right? Then you're stuck on this line, okay? What these values are saying is that at a chi-squared value of 6.06, .06, for example, right? So let's assume I have five degrees of freedom here. Then I can ignore the rest of the table, right? And at a chi-squared of 6.06, .06, the area in the upper tail is 0.3, okay? At a chi-squared of 7.29, notice I've moved out uh, just a little bit into the tail. The area in the tail is 0.2. Right. So what we can do is we can we can just kind of uh, assuming degrees of freedom equals five, right? The shape of this distribution might look something like like this. Yeah. Oops. I kind of lifted off in the end. I didn't want to do that. There. So what this is saying is that here, 6.06, .06, let's put that here, 6.06 .06 has an area in the tail of 0.3. Okay. Moving on to 7.29, 7.29 has an area in the tail of 0.2. And then we can keep going, right? 9.24 has an area in the tail of 0.1, 11.07 has an area in the tail of 0.05. All right, and so let's see here, color haven't I used? 11.07, I'll do that one, it's 0.05. <laughs> okay. These are all chi-squared values. Okay. These are what we call critical values, we're used to talking about critical values in terms of a confidence interval, right? That decides the width of our confidence interval. But in general, the critical values are the values of the test statistic that cuts off um, a portion of the distribution from the top half or the central half, right? And so these are what we call critical values. Okay. And so these, values are critical values. We've been using uh, what's referred to as a p-value approach, right? So when we have a z-table and we can find the p-values quite easily, then it's it's often easier to just do, uh, do hypothesis testing with a p-value approach. Right here, what we're going to find is that once I've calculated my chi-squared, which we haven't done, so it's a little bit vague still, but we will, okay, uh, I'm going to find that it's going to fall on this number line somewhere, right? And then I can use 
So let's say I get a, a chi-squared test statistic of 10, right? A chi-squared, calculated chi-squared of 10 falls between these two values here, which means that the area in the tail, the upper tail, is somewhere between 0.05 and 0.1. Right. And so now, instead of having a precise value for the p-value, I have this range of p-values, which is totally fine. Right, It's somewhere in there, and I can still draw conclusions. Right, Is that going to be less than 0.05? No, right, because the smallest possible value is 0.05, but that belongs to 11.07. Right, So that's 10 is going to be not quite as far out into the tail, right? So we can still draw conclusions with this range of p-values. Or the other approach is to say, okay, if I need an alpha level of, let's kind of mix it up from 0.05, let's do 0.01. If I need an alpha level of 0.01, what I can say then is I could say, okay, then my, my test statistic has to be larger than 15.09, right? And so that's what we call the critical the critical value approach. Uh, let's jot some of that down. We have two options. Okay. The first one is to to find where our calculated chi-squared, so find where the calculated chi-squared, which I'm going to just start writing chi-squared calculated. So that's the one that we've calculated. So find where the chi-squared calculated falls on the number line in the table. Yeah. at the, the appropriate degrees of freedom, of course, at the appropriate degrees of freedom, okay. then trace up to the surrounding p-values. Then trace up to the surrounding p-values to find a range of the p-values. And that range of the p-values, we can still use it to draw our conclusion, okay. which we can use to draw our conclusion. Okay. So just as a, as a quick example, if I let my chi-squared calculated to be 10, right, and my degrees of freedom is five again, right, then I would say that my, my calculated chi-squared is somewhere between 9.24 and 11.07. Oops. Then my chi-squared calculated equal to 10 is somewhere between 9.24 and 11.07. It's catching up here, there, somewhere between these values. Therefore, right, the tail area, now remembering that the tail area is actually, we're moving out further into the tail. So the one on the right is gonna be smaller than the one on the left. So you'll wanna reflect that in your inequalities, or I like to, to just read them from right to left in terms of the probabilities. Okay. And so, therefore, or let's say, so the p value is going to be between 0.05 and 0 0.10. So, notice how I switch these and you read them from right to left. Okay. 
I only did it that way because I like to have the matching inequalities. I know a lot of people don't like inequalities. Um, I'm one of those people. And so I just like to have the consistent inequalities. And then I just remember to read them from smallest to largest, of course, but the p-value is somewhere in between there. Okay. And then I can still use that to compare it to 0.05, right? If the p-value is greater than 0.05, it's here, plain as day, right? Then I don't have enough evidence to reject H0 if the alpha level is 0.05. Okay. The other option, like I mentioned, wait, don't know what happened there, there, <clears throat> is, uh, is the critical value approach. So this one, I would call the p-value approach, the first one. And the second one is the critical value approach. Oops. Critical value approach. And we could have done both approaches for uh, for Z tests, right? So tests of proportions, I just wanted to keep it kind of nice and simple. So I only do the p-value approach, but you can go back and you can try it with a critical value approach, right? What Z score makes alpha to be 0.05, for example, right? And then your Z would have to, your calculated Z would have to exceed that value. Okay. Let me just pause here. All right, so the critical value approach says that we find the value of chi-squared that creates that alpha level, okay? So find the critical value associated with the desired alpha level. the desired alpha level. And if the calculated chi-squared is larger than that critical value, then you have enough evidence to reject H0, right? Because that would mean that the tail area is smaller than the alpha level, right? So then the p-value is less than the alpha level. And so we're doing the same thing. It's just two ways that we can, we can get there, yeah? So um, if the chi-squared calculated it exceeds, let's say, is larger than, but technically exceeds the chi-squared critical, uh, then we have enough evidence to reject H0 then we have enough evidence to reject H0. So just as a, as a little example, right? For example, if we let the chi-squared uh, calculated be 10 again, and the degrees of freedom can be five still, right? And the alpha level can be, or maybe I'll just say alpha equals, let's make it uh, 0.05. Okay. Then what would we do? At an alpha level of 0.05, okay, so now I'm forcing the tail area to be the alpha level, right, 0.05, then the area or the chi-squared value that makes that happen is 11.07, which means that the calculated chi-squared would need to be larger than 11.07, okay? So then, um, the chi-squared, so then the chi-squared critical is 11.07. Okay. 
Mm -hmm. So what this looks like, right? Remembering that our curve, our chi-squared statistic looks like this, right? And we're forcing this area to be alpha equal to 0.05. And the table says that that corresponds to 11.07. So now what we need in order to get a, a p-value less than 0.05, then of course our calculated chi-squared would need to be larger than 11.07. But our calculated chi-squared in this case, this made up case is 10. Okay, And so here, 10 the area in the tail, so the p-value, right, is going to be greater than 0.05, which means I don't have enough evidence to reject H0, right? So here, this is the p-value, right? But in terms of, because now we're, we've moved to the critical value approach, so how we would conclude here is that since the calculated chi-squared is not greater than the critical value for the chi-squared, we don't have enough evidence to reject H0. Okay, so how do we summarize that? We would say, since the chi-squared calculated is equal to 10, is not less than the chi-squared, oh, let me clean that up here, I think chi-squared critical equal to 11.07, we do not have enough evidence to reject H0. Whatever that null hypothesis was in that case. Okay. So a different table, right? A different chi-squared. We haven't calculated a chi-squared. It takes a little bit more work, but not too bad. Okay. Uh, and so I think we're ready for an example here. I've got one picked out. It's from the textbook. And it is, uh, I liked it because it's out of the textbook about textbooks. So... I don't know. I just thought it was funny. And it's, it's what I'm doing. So a professor using an open source introductory statistics book, that's what we're doing, um, predicts that 60% of the students will purchase a hard copy of the book, 25% will print it out from the web, and 15% will read it online. I might switch those, uh, those uh, probabilities, but it, it this is the question. At the end of the semester, he asks his students to complete a survey where they indicate what format of the book they used. Of the 126 students, 71 said they bought a hard copy of the book, 30 said they printed it out from the web, and 25 said they read it online. So notice now I have three sample or three proportions that I want to look at. Okay? And of course, we could look at uh, just the, the proportion who bought the hard copy of the book, just the proportion who said they printed it from the web, read it online, right? But we want to look at uh, just overall as a whole, how are these prepar uh, proportions, how do they compare to the, uh, the original distribution that, that the professor thought it would follow? Okay. And so... Part A says, state the hypotheses for testing if the pro pro professor's predictions were inaccurate. Well, that's got to be some sort of tongue twister. All right. So part A. Okay. If we go back to the formula sheet, right, this little excerpt here. And maybe, you know what, I'm going to copy it and bring it down so I'm not scrolling around so much. Oops. Move this down here. In general, right, we have one uh, categorical variable, what 
uh, what format of the textbook did you use, right? And then there's multiple categories, right? But there's only one variable. So we have uh, a chi-squared goodness of fit test. Yeah. Our null hypothesis, just generically, is going to be that the observed distribution equals the expected distribution. So in this case, what does this mean? It means that the observed distribution of textbook formats used is the same as the distribution of textbook formats that the professor expected at the beginning of the term. Right? So it's a little bit wordy, right? but it's the observed distribution equals the expected distribution. Okay. And so for us, the null hypothesis is going to be the observed distribution of textbook formats is uh, is equal to the distribution the professor expected at the at the beginning of the term is equal to the distribution the professor expected at the beginning of term. What's the alternative of that? It's basically going to be, okay, then the observed distribution is not the same as the expected. Right. And that's, that's totally fine. We just negate it. It's always going to be a, a a two-sided test, although we only have one tail now, so it doesn't really make sense to talk about that anymore. But um, right, it's always going to be different from the observed distribution is different from the expected distribution. And so you can write that out. The observed distribution of textbook formats is not equal to the distribution the professor expected at the beginning of the term. It's not equal to the distribution Okay, I cheated a little bit. The alternative hypothesis is going to be basically just the opposite of the null hypothesis, which is always the case, right? But the observed distribution of textbook formats is not equal to the distribution the professor expected at the beginning of the term. Okay. Great. So now we've got our null and alternative hypotheses. And so now, how many students did the professor expect to buy the book, print the book, and read the book exclusively online? And so how I like to, um, oops, there, how I like to approach these chi-squared problems is I like to make a table, a one-way table, ha, surprise, surprise, okay, where I have my categories, and maybe I need to give myself a line here. I write my, my categories up here. In this case, I have by the book. Okay, and so uh, I'll just call that by the book, print the book, or online. Chi squareds, right, are going to compare some observed count to an expected count. Okay. And so, what I like to do, for me at least, when I'm tackling these problems, is okay, I've got my categories here, and then I've got my observed counts and my expected counts. I think it's going to be easier to write in our observed counts first, and then we can find our expected counts. Okay. So first, let's jot down 
uh, the observed counts. Okay? And these are the counts, not the proportions. Okay? So um, let's see here. The total is 126 students. So I'm going to jot that down at the end of my table here, where I have, I like to have a total just so I can confirm. Now I forgot what it was, 126. 126. Seventy-one, I want to say thirty, and twenty-five. There we go. Sorry, a lot of scrolling here. There. Okay. So then, my expected counts are going to come from those percentages that were established at the beginning of the question, right? Those are what I'm expecting to see, or what this professor is expecting to see. Okay. Of course, my expected counts still have to total 126, okay? And so let's see here. So the total should still be 126, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, they expected 60% to buy the book, okay? 60% of 126. And I guess I... Uh, don't have my calculator here. That's weird. I always have my calculator. 126 times, use my phone. I hate using my phone. Uh, times 0. 0.6, 75.6. For our expected counts, just like we were doing in our success failure conditions when we found the expected number of successes and expected number of failures, we don't do any rounding, right? We keep the decimal answer that we get. Okay. And then for the print, what percentage we expected 25% to print it from the web and then 15% to read it online. So 25% is gonna be 31 and a half. And then, is it 15? 126 times, sorry, 126 times 0.15 is 18.9. I think it was 15. Yeah. Uh -huh. So just to clarify how I got this value, right, is 126 times 0.6. Okay. This is 126 times 0.3, and this is 126. What? <laughs> 25. It wasn't adding to one, so that's why I was extra confused. Okay. These are the expected counts of uh, each of the categories. So what we're really doing is we're comparing 71 to 75.6, as well as 30 to 31.5, as well as 25 to 18.9. We could have done these comparisons one by one, but really what we're interested in with the chi-squared is overall, right, are these, uh, are these things following that expected distribution, okay? Now, um, all right, just to double check, right, add these up to make sure that they actually equal 126. So uh, what do we have here? 75.6 plus 31.5 plus 18.9 is, let me just do that here, plus 126. Okay. Right, they have to total the same value otherwise we've done something wrong and that's why we can't do any rounding here either we we shouldn't 
Okay, so we've got our observed and our expected counts. Okay, and now it's time to compare these. Yeah. Now, let's see here. Before we can do that, we should probably check the conditions and let's see if the question leads us that way. It does. So, uh, this is an appropriate setting for a chi-square test. So they are saying that. Okay? List the conditions required for a test and verify they're satisfied. Okay? So we're gonna check the conditions, but we've also been told that no, we're okay to use the chi-squared here. So just check the conditions and make sure that, that we're on the same page. So let's see here, I should copy this. Uh, our conditions, oh, oh yeah. that's what it looks like when I race, huh? The conditions for chi squared. First condition is independence, right? These counts have to be independent of each other or, or we have to assume that they are independence. So these counts that we have, the students who decided to print it or buy it online or uh, sorry, read online or just buy the textbook, right? We're assuming that these counts are independent of each other. All of these students are in the same class. And so, yeah, of course we could argue that no, they're not independent, but we've already been told that the, the conditions are fine. We can use the chi-squared, why? Well, so then we're gonna assume that these, the students in the class are independent of each other, right? And so we assume, not just independent of each other, but we assume that the, the chosen format of the textbook is independent right, from student to student, okay? That's not necessarily the case, right? My friend buys a hard copy, I go buy a hard copy just because that seems nice, right? Or my friend is reading online, so why would I go out and buy a hard copy, for example, right? But, but we're gonna assume that all these uh, chosen formats are independent of each other. So we assume the format of the textbook Um, chosen by a student is independent of other students. Chosen by the student is independent of other students. Huh? The second condition is the sample size condition, or what did we call, what did they call it rather? Yeah, sample size slash distribution, but let's call it the sample size. We have expected counts of 75.6, 31.5, and 18.9, all of those are greater than five, and so our sample size is large enough. Uh, and maybe I'll say all expected counts, remembering that it's the expected counts that you're checking, all expected counts are greater than five, So the sample size is large enough. The sample size is large enough. Good. <clears throat> Those are the conditions that we need to check for a chi-squared. So we're ready to move on to part D. Part D. 
says to calculate the chi-squared test statistic, okay, the degrees of freedom associated with it, and the p-value. Okay. This is basically step two and step three okay, of a test. And so here, let's call this kind of step one. state the hypotheses, right? And then if I had to kind of break this up to follow the same um, format or the same four steps for a hypothesis test that we have been following, then this would be part D is step two. And then this would be step three. Yeah. But slow and steady wins the race here. So I'm going to say step two, do the test. So far, doing the test has meant calculating a Z score, right? And so now doing the test means calculate a chi squared. Okay. So I'm going to grab. Because the formula sheet is the one that we'll have, or you will have, let's use that one so we get more comfortable with using this formula. Right? Summation notation is a little bit neater than, um, than uh, writing out the sum. Okay. So in our case, right, doing the test is going to mean calculate chi-squared. Yeah. So for each observed value, we're going to subtract that expected value, then square the value, and then divide it by the expected value. Right. So you're going to do that for each of the of the categories. In our case, we only have three categories, so that's nice, right? But it, it, if you have lots of categories, then you'd have to do it many times, and that's annoying. So then maybe you know using Excel or using R would be a, a nice way to go. But for us, right? We still need to calculate this chi squared. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to use this table here. And I'm going to just copy it. And I'm only going to keep what I what I need here. Okay. So really what this is saying is for each observation i, right, and in our case, we have i equals one, i equals two, i equals three, right? And so this is going to be observation one, and this is the expected value for one, observation two, and the expected value for category two, that, observation three, and the expected value for category three. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pause and I'm going to write out this formula. I'll be right back. You won't notice, but I will. Okay. I did a little bit of a side work here. So once we do this calculation, being really careful with your brackets, right, and squaring the numerator and then adding them up, we get a chi-squared of 2.32. Yeah. And so really what we're seeing is how far are these obser wait, whoops, observed values from the expected values in general, just looking at them, right? The only thing that's that's kind of glaring is 25 to 18.9, right? That looks like it's a little bit far. So what we want to know is, is it too far to be considered the same, right? Or insignificantly different, right? And so now we have a chi-squared value that, that um, summarizes that and okay? just overall. So what we find is that the chi-squared, and I'm going to emphasize it with the calculated, 
right? Because this is the one that we calculated when we were talking about finding the p-values, for example, right? I was talking about the chi-squared, the calculated chi-squared. And so this is uh, where that's coming from is going to be 2.32. Right? And that's from there. Okay. And so um, I'm going to use two decimal places. You're welcome to use more, but I'm pretty sure the table only uses two, so that, that's plenty. Okay. So that's going to be uh, doing the test, right? Step two, do the test. In this case, means calculate the chi-squared. Okay. We were also asked to find the degrees of freedom. Okay. I'm going to lump that into step three because we need it to find the p-value. Okay, and so kind of step three, find the p-value. Okay. The degrees of freedom is k minus one, right? Where k is the number of categories. We had three categories, right? You can either buy the book, you can print the book from the web, or you can read it online, right? And so where K is the number of categories that we're comparing, right? So in this case, the degrees of freedom is gonna be three minus one, which means that we have two degrees of freedom, just two. And that's pretty typical, right? We don't we don't tend to have a ton of degrees of freedom, so that's fine. So now what we're going to do is we're going to uh, use the chi-squared table, right? And I just realized I should check to see if the um, if Desmos the calculator has a chi-squared distribution. I'm just going to copy from just the first three degrees of freedom, right? Because I have two degrees of freedom, which means that I'm only looking at this line here. Okay. So the other degrees of freedom, they're out. They don't apply to this problem, right? And so what I want to do is I want to take my calculated chi-squared and I want to place it on this number line, right? We don't get very far. In fact, we don't get into the table at all, right? Uh, let me just pause it here. Okay, trick-or-treaters. Uh, so we're stuck on the two degrees of freedom line. Right, and so I want to show you using both the p-value approach as well as the critical value approach. Right, we'll see that they're they're basically the same. We were asked to find the p-value, right? And so uh, for us, right, what we do is we try to place our calculated chi-square at two point three two, and we start here on the number line, and we don't get very far, right? And so what we do. All right, this calculated chi-squared would go here on the number line, right? 2.3, two is less than 2.41. So, all right, what, what can we make of that? If we think about our chi-squared distribution looking like this, okay, then our chi-squared from the table here, right, 2.41 would be here. Let's say 2.41 is some distance into the tail and we're told that the area in the tail is 0.3. So now if we think about our calculated chi-squared, right, where it falls on the number line is to the left of 2.41 and this is just to visualize Right, and so um, it's 2.32. The p-value here, all we can really say is that it's going to be larger than 0.3, right? So the p-value is larger 
than 0.3. And that's all we really need. That's a, that's a large p-value. We're not going to be able to reject H naught, right? And so here, this is this is with the p-value approach. What about the critical value approach? Well, again, we're going to have chi squared. Oh, two degrees of freedom is a little bit more skewed. You don't need to keep track of that, but it's in my blood. So again, we've got our, our calculated chi squared 2.32. And for the critical value approach, I don't think we were told to use a specific alpha level, so but I am going to confirm that. Um, no mention of a significance level, so let's use 0.05, right? So 0.05. Da, 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 da. So an alpha level of 0.05 would correspond to a chi square of 5.99, okay? And so here, if we're forcing this area to be alpha equal to 0.05, then that corresponds to a chi-squared critical value of 5.99, okay? But again, since 2.32 is not greater than 5.99, we do not have enough evidence to reject H naught. So notice how you get the same conclusion, right? If the p-value is larger than 0.3, it's definitely larger than 0.05, right? So you get the same conclusion and it's just how you get there. And that's just a matter of preference or how the question is worded, right? So, our p-value, all we can really say is that it's larger than 0.3. Now, I am going to pause it. I'm just going to check to see if it's in the Desmos calculator, if there is a It was not. <laughs> uh, the Desmos calculator does find the mean and the standard deviation and a couple of other things, but um, it does not have any of the distributions. That's fine. Um, I just wanted to check. Okay, so uh, let's see here. We have our p-value, it's either larger than 0.3 or our uh, calculated chi-squared is not greater than the chi, the critical value of chi-squared. Chi uh, mumbling my words here. Okay, but let's just use the p-value approach, but just so that you have it for reference, Right. For the critical value approach, since the chi squared calculated equal to 2.32 is, and maybe I'll say does not exceed, does not exceed the chi squared critical equal to 5.99, alpha equal to 0.05. We do not have enough evidence to reject H naught. That's one way that we could state the conclusion. However, we're going to use the p-value for the formal conclusion, right? But this is just as good for our conclusion. Alpha is point, uh, does not exceed 5.99. We do not have enough evidence to reject H naught. Uh, but I know the last part is asking us to draw the conclusion. And so let's go back there and do it properly. Uh, yeah, we did part D and now part E. B. Paste. Based on the p-value calculated in part D, what is the conclusion of the hypothesis test? Interpret your conclusion in this context. Okay, so here we're at 
step four, the conclusion. Even though we don't have a specific p-value, I can still say since the p-value is larger than 0.3, it's not less than 0.05, our alpha level of 0.05. Okay, so since, since the p-value is larger than 0.3, it is not less than our assumed alpha level our assumed alpha level of 0.05 right so the p value is not less than the alpha level which means we do not have enough evidence to reject h naught which means we do not have enough evidence to reject H naught. What does that mean in terms of the question? Well, that means that the original distribution of the textbook formats that the professor had in mind, they fit the distribution right and so the observed uh, distribution of counts for the textbook formats is not significantly different from the expected distribution of counts um, that the professor had at the beginning of the term now i'm just going to steal the the null hypothesis because This is our conclusion. So then I'm going to say, therefore, the observed distribution of textbook formats is equal to the distribution the professor expected at the beginning of the term. Maybe I'll say that term. It's my only change here. OK. Nice. That's it. Easy, right? Same thing as before, right? First, we compare our p value to the alpha level, right? One, compare the p value to the alpha level. Two, your conclusion in terms of H naught. Inclusion in terms of H naught. And then finally, the conclusion in terms of the question. Inclusion in terms of the question. Awesome. So there's chi-squared testing. I will post an assignment, but it has questions for our, uh, for next day as well. So uh, if there's more than two categorical variables, right, so a two-way table, then uh, you can wait until Thursday, or you can read 6.4 on your own. All right. Um, see you on Thursday.